The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents Theocracy. I'm your host, Adam Terrell. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Let's jump into this week's interview. My guest this week is Stephen Rose. Stephen's the admin of anarchochristian.com evaluating the relationship between the Christian and the state. I really recommend you check out his podcast and you can find his group on Facebook, Instagram, and he's also on Twitter. I actually have some friends who know Stephen personally. I happened to mention the Facebook group and lo and behold, my friends were personal acquaintances. So that's when I reached out and I really enjoyed what I found. One technical note, my audio didn't record at the beginning, so we resorted to Stephen's backup recording for the first six minutes. So what sounds like the other end of Skype is actually me at the beginning. Turn your brains on and enjoy. What were some of your uh, biggest political influences? Were they Christian in particular or not necessarily? To sort of outline your previous political journey. Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm guessing you started like most people, just rather, rather normy and sort yeah. of grew into your current viewpoints gradually. Yeah, what were you, some of you the got it. turning points there for you. Yeah, you got it. You know, uh, pretty much your your typical, uh, you know, Christian conservative uh, neocon, you know. And um, I would say that some of the major turning points would be, you know, the Ron Paul revolution uh, from the, I'd say like the 2012 campaign really uh, made a mark. And I, of course, I wasn't fully on board during his uh, his campaign, but some of those things that he that he did really planted a seed and um i think it was it was more watching the reactions of the of the right and the christian conservatives and the the things that they said and did and you know in reaction and retaliation to obama and the the things that that we were verbally willing to compromise on to you know undermine the you know obama's quote the antichrist or something you know those sorts of things really really stood out to me and um you know looking at people like ron paul and going down the you know the constitutional sort of uh um you know political path where you know to become a constitutionalist and then but it it really wasn't uh very long for me to just go from the constitutionalist straight into the um anarcho capitalist uh you know Lysander Spooner sort of you know view view of of the constitution and things like that you know so you're your average 
quote constitutionalist really isn't a constitutionalist in my opinion you know they're they're not really holding to what the constitution says um and then i th- i think that you know once you start digging into the constitution and the the liberty that that you believe that this country was based on and then start digging into the philosophy of that liberty when you start digging into that I think that it's going to lead you right out of that constitution thing and into the uh, voluntarist uh, anarcho, you know, capitalist sort of um, sort of, you know, ideology. You mentioned Lysander Spooner. I'm not really familiar with him. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on him. Yeah. Uh, so Lysander Spooner is a uh, uh, is a great figure in the voluntarist, libertarian, anarchist um you know, ideology. He was a, an abolitionist during the uh, you know the late eighteen hundreds, I believe. I could be a little bit off on my dates there, um, but he most notably his most recognizable uh, quote, I guess you could probably find if you just googled him, would be his quote about the Constitution and that it is, um, you know, whether or not. I'm going to totally butcher it, but, you know, whether he says whether it's one thing or another, you know, people are arguing about it, whether it's one thing or another, there's two things to keep in mind that it has either given us this tyrannical government that we have today, or it's been powerless to stop it. Okay. Yeah. I think I've seen that quote. Yeah. And I, so in either way, it's, you know, unfit to exist. So obviously very harsh words for, a constitutionalist to hear because a constitutionalist, you know, holds that, that document as this, um, you know, almost sacred text, you know? So right. hearing that is a, I think a, a pretty big wake up call, but if you're already going down that path of, um, consistency in your libertarian ideology, then, um, I think it, there's nothing you could say to push back against it. It was uh, broken, you know, right off the bat, you know, and, um, even with, you know, George Washington and, and even the earliest, uh, you know, founders. Um, so they're, they're again, you know, powerless and, and there's little things inside of it that are, that are obviously not perfect and don't live up to these, um, ideals of liberty and freedom. Oh, sure. I mean, it created the post office for heaven's sake, (laughs) which is actually funny since we're talking about Spooner that he, uh, he created a, uh, a postal service that was a, a, you know, rivaled the post office and where he ended up, uh, you know, it, it was a better program than the post office, obviously, you know, um, how private institutions are going to be superior to the public ones. And, uh, they had to shut them down, you know? <laughs> well, I think you and I have a, quite a bit of agreement, but we're coming at it in terms of definitions, I think from, uh, as, far opposite as you can. I, I think of it more as theocracy, and you use the term anarchy. What's your definition of anarchy? So anarchy is simply no rulers, and that is, that's it simply, uh, that someone can't rule over another person. And obviously that, that would not include uh, voluntarily placing yourself underneath somebody else's authority. Sure. Yeah. Hierarchies uh, can exist. And that's going to be an argument that would happen between someone as myself or someone that considers themselves an anarcho-communist that would, you know, use phrases like abolish a hierarchy or or something like that. Most people think of, um, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails through store windows and stuff like that. And that's not necessarily what you mean. Yes, absolutely. That is the uh, picture that most people see when they think of the word anarchy or they kind of envision this Mad Max sort of future. And uh, yeah, that's that's simply not what anarchy means. And it's, you know, just real basic definition. A lot of people look at me crossways when I talk about theocracy. And I, I really think that we are sort of coming at this from the, the same perspective. Uh, obviously, God is our ruler and we want him to be anything else is going to be some form of tyranny because nobody is a perfect ruler except for God. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm not particularly fond of the, the term theocracy either. Um, just because when it's used, it's, uh, like anarchy, it's, 
you know, typically used for the way that man is going to rule, uh, over and around other men. And, um, you know, I like to use the illustration of anarchy being a horizontal relationship between man and man and, and, um, and the reason why it's compatible with Christianity is because our relationship with God is not on that horizontal level. It's on a, um, a vertical level. So I would also say that the typical definition of theocracy and the way that it's used and the way that it's, it's, uh, typically meant is still on that horizontal level. So you would be, you know, having man rule over another man, uh, but the, you know, theocracy would be your, uh, would be your doctrine that you use for, uh, ruling over that other man. And that is why we can have a Christian theocracy or a Muslim theocracy or a Hindu theocracy or however it is that, uh, whatever religion it is that you want to use, um, you can have a theocracy in that religion. The, the same way that people react to anarchy, they, they uh, have a knee-jerk reaction to theocracy as well. But then I start talking about more of a decentralized or a bottom-up theocracy, and people are sort of like, oh, okay, so now I sort of see you're just sort of using that as a, uh, a, a way to hook people in and, and get them interested because you're like, well, you can't possibly mean like we start the Crusades again and stuff like that. Are you? And I'm like, no, definitely not. Yeah, and I think that the reason why they they have that um, that view, and myself included, is because it, it, typically the term theocracy is used in relation between man to man. Um, I'm okay with using the term uh, in a personal level if you say that you're, I guess, um, you know, inwardly theocratic. Um, I'm fine with that, but typically the term is used for how you're going to relate to your neighbor or rule over another person. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely put myself in that camp where I, I do uh, squeam a little when people start using the, the term theocracy, because again, it's um, typically intended or defined as a relationship between you know, man to man, that horizontal relationship, that political relationship between other people. Right. Well, I do, I do mean it in that sense, but I think most people think of it like the way that I want to affect theocracy. Most people think of it as, well, I'm just going to go out there and start, um, killing people that disobey God, uh, rather than me offering myself as a sacrifice in order to sanctify. It's sort of a win-win. It's, it's like if somebody wrongs me, I, if I think that they're wrong, my response to them should be one of grace. And if they're right, then, and I was actually in the wrong, then my response should still be one of grace. And so it doesn't really change my response one way or another. My response is always to sacrifice myself and to try to, um, bring justice and see justice done in every situation whether the other person suffers or whether I suffer for it, um, I'll be rewarded either way. Sure. And that's fair. Um, I think that what, yeah, what you are running up against though, is that the typical, uh, Christian or evangelical definition of a theocracy, uh, for a Christian theocracy would be one where you are imposing some form of mosaic law against, uh, against your neighbor and, um, you know, that's where we get a lot of our, you know, moral, moral laws that, you know, really uh, align with, um, you know, Christian evangelicalism. And, um, that I think would be probably the, the biggest roadblock that you're running into when, you know, using the term, you know, the, uh, Christian theocracy. There are some things that I'm actually kind of shocked that I don't get more pushback on. Uh, like an abolition of the prison system and also public stoning as well. I also get a really positive response to an abolition of public stoning or N no, in, the imp in favor, the implementation of it. Yeah. Most of the people, especially libertarians that I talk to, uh, when you flesh it out, because I think most people, most libertarians have a big problem with the state executing people that the state has a monopoly on that. 
Yeah, which I, I agree. I'm I'm against the state having um you know capital punishment or you know having that you know I guess right for lack of better words uh you know having the monopoly on violence and and all that good stuff all those good talking points you know that we have um I'm I'm not in favor of the state having that and I also don't think that it uh, aligns with our Christian values of what you've already brought up with, you know, having grace with someone else and things like that. Right. And that's why I think uh, public stoning would be a great uh, would be a great thing because it would take the uh, power of execution out of the hands of of the few of the state and it would put it directly into the hands of the people to where if a judge rules something that's wrong and he condemns somebody to death or whatever, then the people it would be the people's duty just to not enforce that. Um, and we see that when I think it's in first Samuel, Saul makes a rash vow and says, um, before, until we win this battle, uh, I'm going to kill anybody that eats. And then once we've won the battle, then people can start eating again. Well, his son, Jonathan didn't hear that. And he ate some honey. Okay, Jonathan, we're going to kill you. And all the people said, no, you're not. And so they kept Saul from, you know, from killing Jonathan. Um, and I think you would see the exact same thing today if the power of public execution was taken out of the hands of the state. People would um, see, okay, the the government's being tyrannical here. We're not going to put somebody to death because it's, you know, it's the hands of the people that are supposed to do it. That's uh, that's well and good as far as pushing back against state enforced, uh, you know, death penalty and um, execution. But what about when, you know, the people democratically decide that we are going to kill somebody um, that then you run into defining yourself as the state? Because now you have the ability to take someone's life and kill them and and. Uh, judge, jury, and executioner over this person's life. And um, so, one, I think in within libertarian philosophy, you are now becoming the state. And you're you're putting yourself in that position to, to be the state. And then as well, I think that that doesn't uh, line up with New Testament understanding of, of, um, of executing somebody. Okay. I would argue... That it does for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, obviously the person that's supposed to initiate the execution are the witnesses. And if the witnesses accuse somebody of a capital crime and they're found out to be false witnesses, then they're, they get killed instead. Um, so you're not going to have people going around initiating capital cases willy-nilly, first of all. Um, second of all, there are um, at least two different examples that I can think of where Jesus was actually in favor of the death penalty. Um, one of them was actually for uh, rebellious children being put to death, which he condemned the Pharisees for not doing. Um, and then also the woman caught in adultery, though I don't like to use that one as much because of um, there's some serious question over to whether that one's actually um, original or not. But assuming that it is, um, Jesus called for the witnesses and they didn't come forward. And so you can't exactly have uh, an execution with no witnesses. Yeah, I disagree on that one. Uh, I'm familiar with the, you know, with the historicity uh, question of that verse uh, or of that passage. And um, I'm, I don't let it bother me, though, in using it. It, it is there in the Bible. I, and I think that, um, you know, there is that whole slippery slope once we start removing things that maybe we haven't found one as uh, as early a copy as we'd like um we've had that happen before and lo and behold those copies eventually show up i'm still waiting for those copies as well so i'm i'm i haven't totally i'm not throwing out that passage i'm just saying that i would use it i would use it more often um cuz i think the earliest copy that we have of it is at like 400 AD and when it does appear it jumps all over uh the book of john so it doesn't even appear in the same place on a regular basis. Okay. And, well, and even then, um, in the way that uh, I guess you're interpreting it, I, I would use that verse to to be against the death penalty because um, he doesn't call for the witnesses to show and then there's a no-show. 
he he doesn't do that at all. He specifically talks to their their sin. Are they sinners? And if they're not, uh, then they can you know go through with it. But if they are sinners, which everyone is, uh, then they can't. You know, they don't have the authority to kill someone. You know, within uh, within the new covenant here. So you would disagree that anybody should ever be put to death for any reason. I really am can't come up with um, a real good uh, reason for someone to be killed in a in a vengeful manner. Um, now, if someone were, I'm not against um, defense of of your neighbor, whoever that neighbor might be, family, friend, you know, ten feet away from you, or a friend, uh, you know, or a person that you don't even know. You know, I, I look at the term neighbor um, right in a, in a much bigger picture. It's not just someone who, who has this, the address right next to yours, right? Um, but it, I, I think that to love our neighbor uh, requires us to defend them, and if we have to defend them, you know. Um, using using uh you know a well measured uh, amount of force uh in their defense i think that that's completely uh acceptable within within christianity and uh should that person's uh you know persistence lead to their death um i don't i i think that that's that's still within reason uh but to take them up in a trial and uh and execute them i think that again we're we're coming up against our our problem with uh you know those who have you know not sinned cast the first stone and then also our our um you know we we come up with having the same faults as the uh, as the state does and all, all of those uh problems that we the reason why we want to take capital punishment away from the state, well, the state is just made up of people. So whether you want to call it a judge or a state or a mob of people, it's still just people executing another person. Right. The whole question is, does the Bible give them the authority to do it or not? Yes. And I, I believe that authority was removed in the new, in the new covenant. And would that John eight passage be the, the pr- primary one that you'd point to? Yeah, I think it's the easiest, the easiest one. Other than that, I think it would just be a uh, long dive into grace and forgiveness and, and, um, you know, and Jesus laying down his life and understanding, uh, you know, that entire concept of, you know, of, um, you know, like I said, grace and forgiveness. Yeah, I'm obviously all for grace and forgiveness. Um, The question that I would have is that where does that like some something has to suffer the penalty right when when uh christ wanted to show us grace and forgiveness he didn't just uh snap his fingers and make the penalty go away somebody had to take it it was just somebody else and took he it. did right yeah, and, and he did so he has suffered the penalty for everyone of all time uh small or large sin however you would want to uh you know qualify anything into those categories that was paid what happens to people that steal they don't have to worry about like paying back or restoring anything that they for anything wrong that they do now well i think it's good if they do you would say that for pretty much everything except for capital crimes that people should be be expected to pay back what they stole i think that uh we can look at it a couple of different ways if we're looking at it in the kind of the ideal way that we would structure our libertarian values. Um, you know, there's there's ways to look at it where you would have judges and arbitrators and um, insurance and, um, you know, things like that. Um, and, you know, and just pre- theft prevention. But, um, you know, when we look at the scripture of the New Testament and, um, you know, we look at verses where we're told that if someone steals our jacket, give them our shirt as well. Uh, if someone uh, forces us to walk one mile, then walk two, um, you know, things like that, um, then we are looking at ways that that are difficult for us 
you know, because it, it does seem to go against our our sense of of judgment, uh, of of um, of justice. I think I'd really argue that that actually establishes the law. Um, this is an example that I like to use. First, I think it'd be it'd be good to just do a quick um, review of the different penalties for theft, depending on the attitude of the thief. So, in the Mosaic Law, if somebody steals. Um, let's say a sheep and then they're caught with it, then they have to pay back two sheep, right? They -hmm. pay back the one that they stole. Plus they pay another one as a, as a penalty so that exactly what they had sought to do to somebody else is done to them. And then if they steal a sheep and then they sell it or they kill it and they don't have it anymore, then they're supposed to pay back four sheep. And if they steal a sheep and then, or they find um, somebody's that's lost and they don't return it to that person, and then they feel guilty about it and then they do decide to return either the sheep that they stole or found and said nothing about, then they're supposed to give the sheep back plus a, a fifth of the value of the sheep. So it's a reduced penalty if the person is repentant and turns themselves in. So now imagine going back to the Sermon on the Mount somebody steals my shirt and then I give him my jacket. And then let's say now imagine I call the authorities or accuse him of stealing my shirt and then I take him in to see a judge. When the judge does justice and forces the guy to give me my shirt back, he'll have to give me an additional item, right? Because the penalty is two, two shirts for stealing a shirt. So he gives me back the one that uh, he stole from me, but then he also gives me back the jacket that I gave to him as the additional item. And so when everything's all done and cleared, I get back everything that was originally mine. The, The thief is out nothing. He's not in debt. He didn't have to pay one of his own shirts. And now he understands the law and he's not going to do that again. Yeah, I think that you run into a couple of uh, sticky situations there uh, with kind of picking and choosing what sorts of um, Old Testament uh, mosaic law that you're going to, you know, mirror. Um, in this one, you're you're taking this uh, this the way that this is laid out about the sheep, and you're you're uh, you know saying that this is what we're going to do exactly like this. But um, you know, there's a ton of uh, punishments in the Old Testament that um, that you would probably want to stay away from, um, and so which I don't have any problem with those being in the Old Testament, but that's a that's a whole other conversation, and so I'm not saying that they're they're bad punishments, but we run into some problems when we're trying to uh, craft everything. To look just like the Old Testament, but we're, you know, leaving out bits and pieces that may be a little bit more uncomfortable. And then also, I would say that uh, when you use the uh, the Sermon on the Mount of giving your your jacket to somebody, and then you uh, immediately turn to uh, calling the authorities. And um, now I, I don't have any problem with calling the authorities, uh, but I think when we are talking about um, you know, trying to imitate Christ and trying to do exactly as we are shown uh, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, that calling the authorities really isn't part of that equation. No, I just use it as uh, to sort of bring home an illustration, because my attitude is if somebody steals something from me, my attitude is, well, I know that God is going to require justice from that person at some point. And so what I want to do in my attitude is do everything that I can to um, spare that person the penalty. Because at some point, I mean, we live in a just world. If you do something bad, then you're going to suffer the penalty for it. Um, Not necessarily here, though. That's the thing is our justice, our justice and our redemption uh, may, you know, may not happen here. Um, It's... uh, you know, there's something much bigger at work with, uh, you know, 
the, with the atonement of Christ. And um, it's bigger than, than here and now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the things that do have penalties here and now, though, like if somebody steals, um, let's say somebody steals some some soda from a store, if it if that starts happening often enough at the store, they're going to have to raise the prices so that they don't lose money. So in that sense, it does punish people like people are paying the that economic penalty for something being stolen. Sure, but I don't think that we can get into the economic uh, argument um, while also trying to maintain the uh, kind of spiritual atonement side of the of the conversation. I'd argue that they're pretty closely related. They're almost the same thing. Well, because you're, you're saying that that sin has to be paid for, um, but the thing is, is that it, it was paid for on the cross. Uh, it that depends if the person is a believer. Would you agree? Or have unbelievers had their sins atoned for also? Right. So if we're getting into the election, the elect and the faithful, yeah, the, uh, that is, that I, I do see where you're going with that. And, uh, but no, all the sin of, of the world was paid for with Christ. Now there are people who, are not of the faith and yes they will not go to heaven but uh that i think is again it's blurring these lines between what it was that christ did on the cross and then how it is that we're supposed to then react and act towards each other i do agree there um christ christ did pay for the sins of the whole world and there's a couple of different aspects to salvation there there's salvation of God's people, which transferred them from Satan's kingdom into Christ's kingdom. There's an, there's also another sense of salvation. People will be saved temporally, not in an eternal sense, but they will be made prosperous in this life. Um, there are tremendous blessings that unbelievers have experienced because of the death of Christ work that has been done, technology that's been invented, um, medical advances, all kinds of things like that. And people have been physically saved, maybe not spiritually, um, as a result of Christ's death and resurrection. Yeah. I I don't, uh, I don't like putting that into the category of somehow being a a part of the, uh, death on the cross, you know, it says that even the unbelievers, God sends rain even on the unbelievers. And so that's something outside of of salvation and, and uh, Jesus' work on the cross. Because we're not promised prosperity. I think it was happening even prior to that, though. And um, it's something that, in my opinion, is God's grace, but having nothing to do with the atonement. What are some key Bible passages that you wish that people were more familiar with um, or applied more biblically in terms of uh, political things? There's there's quite a few of them. I, you know, the first one that pops up is usually Romans 13, right? Of course. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that um, I think that that's something that we can shy away from, but I don't think that we should. I think that we should have a, a good defense, you know, as uh, I think it's Peter that says we should have a good defense, uh, you know, for, for our faith. I think it's within this, us. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the same thing with, uh, you know, with, with our beliefs here uh, in Romans 13, you might want to, it might make you want to run away. Um, but I think that we can, we could even use it in a more, um, I guess not a defensive manner is what I'm trying to say, uh, but have a good grasp of, of it and um, start looking at Romans 13, you know, outside of that statist sort of uh, definition. I think that's a healthy thing. <laughs> yeah. So I would say using Romans 13, but not necessarily in a defensive manner is something that we, we should work on. And um, other than that, uh, I think you brought up Samuel, first Samuel eight is a big one. That, yes. that was one that was a big, uh, big eye opener for, for me. Yeah. It's and, like, um, you're going to get taxed at 10%. Like, are you ready for this? People right. buckle up. <laughs> this is God's judgment against you. Here it comes. 10% taxes. Yeah. 10% taxes. You're going to be, you know, uh, enslaved to the King's military. 
you know <laughs> it, he lays out a a whole bunch of things and uh and and he says it all that it's a that this is happening because it's a rejection of him mm-hmm. as king you know and i think that that christians need to be much more aware of of uh what what god said there <laughs> Right. And it's not that uh, asking for a king just all by itself was not necessarily the wrong thing because there was a provision in the law for them to ask for a king, but they did it in the wrong way. They didn't ask for one in a lawful way and rejected God in order to do so. And that's when he's like, yeah, buckle up. This is this is going to be your punishment here. Yeah. And so often, you know, we see, you know, we we say we like to say uh, no king but Christ, you know, and so, you know. Christ is our king. God is our king. And, um, you know, any sort of, um, you know, demand for a king like the other people, like, you know, that's what they say. We want to be like the world, you know, uh, but yet we're told time and time and again, don't look like the world. You know, we are a different people set apart, you know, and we have our king who is Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, Well, what are some of your goals in terms of your political influence, uh, how, like how is your social media doing, and do you have goals with that? You know, I never thought of it like that with uh, as as having a goal. <laughs> it's just something uh, on the side that you just started, and it sort of took off. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it really was just something kind of born uh, mainly out of frustration, I'd say. Um, uh, you know, with uh, the current culture. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and it, it just took off. And so I, I'm happy to see that. I'm, I'm extremely happy. And I, I get, uh, you know, notes from people a lot. We have a very uh, active online community. Uh, just, um, it's great to see this message really resonating with people. And I think that, and you'd probably agree with the, the current political culture, how it just seems to get bigger and bigger and and more divisive i think that really it's that that divisiveness that that really uh started getting to me and i think it's getting to a lot of people well steven you're just a you're just a democrat you disagree with me so you must be a democrat and i don't like democrats (laughs) so i don't have to listen to you talk anymore (laughs) yeah yep that's it (laughs) Um, what are some of the hot button topics that you see being discussed most right now in terms of your own, the you know, the anarcho-Christian community? Uh, the topics, uh, you know, it, it seems to always go back to, you know, the Romans 13 sort of thing and very much divided up between, you know, our side versus your side, you know, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, you know, however it is that, that people want to phrase it and look at it. Um, it really is turned into that that two sides that is so strongly opposed to each other which aren't really all that different from each other oh yeah yeah i could uh, i could rant about that all day long <laughs> you know <laughs> with um you know it's not it's not socialism it's democratic socialism it's not socialism socialism it's republic socialism you know it's it's uh, it's kind of the same thing when you when you start boiling it down you know it just plays out very much the same yeah it's uh pretty scary i was having a discussion on a fox news channel about trump building building the wall or using another billion dollars to fund another 57 miles of the wall and just all the people cheering about all the land that they're having to steal from people to build the wall on and as well as the tax money and it's just like you you ask one person what gives the government the authority to take people's property and they're like you must be a democrat you're just you know just trolling on the fox news page you need to go away democrat fox news has has really uh cultivated quite the following here <laughs> yeah it's just uh you know shouting down your opponent you know as as loudly and harshly as possible you know and and that's uh just shutting down any sort of uh you know conversation and it's uh i think it's most interesting when it starts to get into the when you're trying to get into that consistency and show someone the consistency of their beliefs and we were talking earlier about the the constitution and you know that it really does come down to a lot of that you know when people say i i support 
I'm a constitutionalist, but but yet I support this, that, and the other, you know. And and then of course, where I'm even further down the line, where I'm not even worried about the Constitution, I, I think it's I think it's a good talk historically and and for consistency. Sure. But I'm coming from the exact same place. I used to uh, I was, I grew up homeschooled, and we would talk about the Constitution all the time, and um, even getting into um, the different founding fathers' opinions on which uh, are treaties binding and do they supersede the Constitution or do they underneath it or beside it and all this really advanced stuff. And then I remember um, waking up one morning to hear my dad listening to a YouTube video uh, and it was talking about where the Constitution disagrees with the Bible. It's void and we can ig- safely ignore it. And I never heard anybody say that before and i was just like i gotta watch all these videos this is amazing (laughs) what are some of the most positive results that you see being cultivated in america from an anarchist perspective so i I think that uh getting back to you know this idea of you know not relying on the state is one of the most positive aspects Hmm. um you know this idea that we don't need the state for you know not not just things like defense but also uh even things like welfare you know where we can you know rely on on charity and voluntary interactions um i think that that sort of message i think it resonates and um i think that uh if i were to, to try to be you know really optimistic i would say that that is something that really is reaching people just the idea of encouraging them not to take food stamps and not to go to the public schools and all that stuff yeah you know i think it's it's not necessarily that encouraging people not to take food stamps but it's this idea that we can do better we can do better either through private charities or private businesses that can be better and more profitable for, for people, you know? So, um, so like I said, not out there as an activist saying, everyone get off your food stamps or or something like that, but waking up people to the idea that we can do better. We can form, uh, private organizations and voluntary charities that are better than the government's, um, you know, chair, you know, quote charities with trackable results and proof and evidence that we can just blow everything that the government's doing out of the water. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those are exciting things that I see too, as well as, you know, there are a few famous attempts like Bitcoin, Mm -hmm. but even things, local churches dealing with their problems and not having to involve the authorities, you know, people just Mm -hmm. judging themselves well, and living peacefully with other people and, you know, being an example. Yep, absolutely. And I think that a lot of that is just comes from an ideological change, but I, but I think it's happening. I, I'm, I'm, I remain optimistic about that. And I think that's one reason that a lot of people are, are so caught up in the short term arguments of, you know, Republican versus Democrat is because they're really not optimistic. I think it's, sort of forces you to have to pick one of those sides because, well, the next election is the most important thing ever. I hadn't really looked at it as a optimistic or pessimistic thing, but yeah, I, I, I do agree that, um, we, we sort of lose that, that optimism and we just, uh, are looking for the, uh, the fight and the battle. Right. That doesn't ironically doesn't really matter because the most important battle is the one that's going to be happening in 30 years, but nobody talks about uh, changing the conversation for 30 years from now. Yeah, it's uh, it's always uh, right now, but then the next one will always be right now. Until you find out that, well, even just something as simple as the primaries, you just go back a few months earlier and the entire debate for the presidential election was framed by just a few thousand people because they actually care just a tiny little bit more than everybody else. And you get to decide who runs up against Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of that is just, it's all theater anyways. Um, oh, sure. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just using that as a fun example that everybody's familiar yeah. with. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, it just uh, gets people just pitted against each other, my side versus your side, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like I want to reframe the entire discussion to where it's not Republicans and Democrats. It's where we can have a discussion over whether we should have a prison system versus not have a prison system. That's the types of discussions that I want to be having in, you know, 30 yeah. years. And so what can I do now in order to start laying groundwork for that discussion to be had at that time? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that it is those discussions and it is um, when you do, um, you know, have those moments where you realize that, oh, wait a minute, we can achieve this without the strong arm of the state, you know, defensive or offensive. We could do better at all of these things, uh, you know, through private and voluntary interactions. Yep. And it's uh, really peaceful uh, when you're not having to butt up and try to change people's minds, you know, within the next six months or for the next presidential cycle or whatever. It's a little bit easier. It's quite a bit slower, but easier and quite a bit less stressful when you're thinking yeah. 30 years out. <laughs> Think like a tree. And so I, I'm enjoying this being a bit slower paced. It's nice. Even if we do disagree on things, you know, I hope that I just come off as um, appreciating the discussion and, and not uh, at all combative. I try to be the same way. I, I think a lot of people um, are kind of embarrassed of a lot of the stuff that's in the Old Testament. And yeah. I think I, I sort of want to nip that in the bud. And if you really delve into them, I think they're actually very gracious if you were to try to follow them and apply them to yourself. Because obviously the goal is to never have to go through a court system because you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. That's the whole goal. But you also have to know how to deal with it because the law ultimately is a path to restoration. If I mess up, here's how I can make it right. If I steal something from somebody, this is what I have to go. I give him back this plus, you know, and it depends on what I stole, how it was done and all these different types of things so that I can understand how that I can make atonement for something that I did wrong or that something that somebody else did wrong. Yeah, um, I, uh, I'm i in full agreement that uh, it is unfortunate that so many people, um, you know, even in our, in our circles might um, kind of squeam away from the, the Old Testament or kind of reject it. Um, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure where it is that, that you come from theologically, but, uh, but I do agree that it's something that it, it does have its, its answers there and we don't have to be afraid of it. You know, um, it is under, it is able to be understood, um, within the, you know, the context of itself and within, you know, it's not, it's not opposing the, the new covenant or the new Testament at all. And, um, yeah, I think that we, we do need to, um, we do need to be able to answer that and not be afraid of it. Um, as well, I would say that uh, the law. You, now you use the phrase that that I would um, I would maybe question uh, that it's our path to, to righteousness. Um, and so, where it is that, and maybe we maybe we mean the same thing. We're just using different terms. But um, I would say that the law, you know, points us to knowing our, our sin, knowing our guilt and knowing that we need that redemption. But the, the real redemption only uh, comes through Christ. It's not something that we will actually achieve by understanding, uh, you know, mosaic punishments and fulfilling those punishments ourselves, that it was actually all fulfilled through, through Christ his death and resurrection. Right. And he has given us that fulfillment as a, as a grace. Um, there's another illustration I'd like to use. There's a picture of the old and the new covenant in the giving of the 10 commandments. So the first time that God gives Moses the 10 commandments, you know, he takes them down the mountain and he breaks them as soon as he sees the people's idolatry. Mm -hmm. That's the, the picture of the old covenant. It's the one that we, it's the covenant that we broke. We couldn't keep it. And it, it will kill us if we can't keep it. So Moses goes back up the mountain a second time and God says, okay, I'm going to give you the same rules that I just gave you. I'm not going to change them. I'm going to give them to you again, except this time I'm going to speak them. And then Moses, you're going to write them down so that these instructions are going to come from your heart. 
And then Moses takes them down and he puts them in the um, Ark of the Covenant, which then goes into the heart of the temple. And then the temple obviously is a picture of God united with his people. And so it's not a difference. The old covenant versus the new covenant. I know a lot of people like to say, well, it's law versus grace. Well, what is grace? Grace is having placed the law within the heart so that we want to obey. And also we now have the ability to obey because of Christ's obedience to it. And so now we have the ability to obey in the spirit of the law, whereas before we didn't because the law was outside of our bodies condemning us. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't a hundred percent agree with that. You know, I, I think that um, the, the pictures and the, the foreshadowing of the, the temple and the law, uh, you know, we're also looking at, you know, ourselves and the Holy Spirit. And we were told in the new covenant with Christ that, um, you know, that he is, you know, the redemption, he's the fulfillment. And um, the law, again, it points us to our our knowledge of our, our, our guilt and our shame and our shortcomings and, um, and that we do need a savior. But again, uh, I would say that, um, you know, like you said, it's not law against grace, it's law and grace, you know, this law and the gospel. And, um, the thing is, is that again, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to achieve perfection at all. Um, uh, I don't know if, um, if maybe you, you, uh, are one that holds to the idea that we will somehow be perfect, uh, before we die. Definitely not. Okay. Uh, my, my opinion is that we, we won't, uh, that's what I, I believe the Bible says. So I hate to even use the word opinion. Uh, I guess just, uh, um, yeah, I'm misspeaking there, but we, we won't be perfect. Um, and so. You know, no, it doesn't I agree. matter. Christ was po- perfect okay. on our behalf. Okay. So uh, again, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, I'm thankful that, um, that God has given me the, the faith and, and the heart of flesh to see that I am a sinner and also to see the work that was done on my behalf. Yep. Yeah, I would def- very much agree. Uh, without the law, we would not have seen our need for a savior. And that was the primary purpose of the law. It was given because of transgressions so that we can understand what the penalty was that we didn't have to pay that Christ did on on our behalf. Mm. And so now that he has done it, now I want to obey. Now I want to be obedient. Yeah. Agreed. And to do that, I have to understand what the law says like because the law ultimately is a is um an aspect of god's love this the law as it was laid forth was if we were able to keep it would prevent us from enduring punishment yeah and we're not (laughs) right we're not able to and so it also gives um instructions for how to make wrongs right which christ followed and if he hadn't kept the law on our behalf then we would be in serious trouble and so i'm very glad that he did yeah uh yeah i mean he wouldn't be the christ he wouldn't be the messiah if he hadn't (laughs) right you know it's um you know his uh i think uh i think the the proper term is his active obedience while he was alive um is uh just as important a point as his uh, going to the cross. There's a passage in Deuteronomy four. Um, it starts in verse five. Uh, I had mentioned that a lot of believers, I think are embarrassed about the old Testament laws. And I think this passage in Deuteronomy four says that we're supposed to have the opposite attitude than what most believers have today. Uh, verse five, it says, see, I've taught you statutes and rules as the Lord, my God commanded me that you should do them in the land you're entering to take possession of it, keep them and do them for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Wait, like laws about stoning and burning and, um, cutting off a woman's hand for doing certain things. Uh, 
And it's like, yeah, that's supposed to be your wisdom and your understanding. The obvious answer is there is no other God that has rules that are so righteous. Where do we get the laws about um, theft and what to do if um, somebody accidentally burns a field, how much they owe and all this type of stuff that we literally have had it handed down from the sky. <laughs> yeah. And where, where I think that maybe we would uh, have our disagreements would be on the ideas of, um, you know, the restitutions and the, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of those, uh, those things are good examples for us now. Um, for justice and things like that, but in the larger picture of the law and um, and atonement and things like that, I, I think that um, you know very much like the ceremonial aspects of the law um, and other other aspects that people point to, like eating shellfish and uh, things like that, where we're shown you know in the new covenant how that was a foreshadowing of of um, you know our relationship to Christ and our relationship to each other. Um, you know, those things are fulfilled where our focus on the law at that point really is what Jesus boils it down to. It's loving God and loving our neighbor. So that's where I don't, uh, I don't spend a lot of time, um, trying to see how we can implement ceremonial or, you know, restitution from the Mosaic covenant. I'm not exactly sure how familiar you are with, um, theonomists and the the term theonomy. Um, my view is that all of the laws still apply except where they've been specifically, uh, the form of them has been specifically changed in the new covenant. So in regard to, um, there a lot of people will talk about like the civil versus the ceremonial and the moral law in the old Mm -hmm. Testament. I don't necessarily see that, um, in the new covenant. The only differentiation that I see made is between light and shadow. I think a good deal of the law in the old Testament is actually light. Um, it's actually like it, it should not be changed from the old covenant to the new covenant. It still applies the same way. Some of the most popular ones were when Jesus summarizes the two greatest commandments. Most people think of those as just the new Testament, uh, love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is quoting Leviticus. And so that part hasn't changed from the old covenant to the new covenant, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say it's it's um, you know it's a it's a summation of the you know left table right table of the of the you know ten commandments you know the first half is our relationship to God and the second half is our relationship to to other men other people you know and so he kind of condenses all of that into those two sentences the greatest law being that side of the of the law which is between us and god and then the other one between us and and our neighbor right the first four commandments versus the last six Mm -hmm. um there's a there's a passage in matthew 5 this is a sermon on the mount as well um when jesus talks about fulfilling the law um oh also i wanted to go back um uh about like eating shellfish and things like that um Mm. those were different laws about having to be clean when you are offering sacrifices in the temple. And so I think we do still have to be clean because we do still offer sacrifices in the temple daily. There is still a temple, right? We still offer sacrifices in it. We're priests. All believers in the new covenant are priests. Um, And so you couldn't eat unclean foods because priests had to be clean when they offer sacrifices in the temple. And also God's people as a whole were supposed to be clean. And that's why they couldn't eat, uh, pork and shellfish and shrimp and things like that. And catfish that, um, you know, that cleanliness though, it's not done through our, our righteousness. It's done through Christ's death on the cross. And that's why, um, all of that is, is kind of, shown to us through the vision that Peter has, where he says, you can eat these things. Nothing that I've created is now, is now separate. And 
then that illustrates how he can now associate with these other people that are that were not believers you know so that whole thing that 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 cleansing you know um all of that is is pointing to to Christ and not our work in achieving and fulfilling the law, but is pointing to Christ in his fulfillment. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's, I like to tell people, it's not that we're allowed to eat unclean things now. It's that those foods were made clean. And also, uh, in regards to being pure to offer sacrifices in the temple, Christ has made me clean in the ultimate sense. And so I am, I am supposed to be clean when I offer sacrifices. Christ, Christ made me permanently clean, and he also made the Gentiles clean. In Matthew 5, there's a passage where it's obviously it's the passage where Christ says he came to fulfill the law. And in verse 19, or verse 18, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And that's basically my view in a nutshell of the law. Um, It's not a question of which laws apply and which ones don't. It's that they all apply. And the question is, which ones have had their form changed in how we keep them in the new covenant? And so I'm not looking when I read the Old Testament, I'm not looking for this is harsh. I, I want to try to think of some way that I don't have to do what this says. Now, when I read it, I think this is true and this is good and I should want to obey it. So how, how do I, and it's forced me to deal with some really difficult things, but I think in a very healthy way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we should, uh, you know, we, we should take all of this and really examine, you know, examine ourselves. And, uh, you know, we talked uh, earlier about, you know, kind of, you know, being, you know, inwardly theocratic, you know, I, I totally, um, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, th- I think, um, you know, without really, you know, I guess, dissecting that and getting into what that would, what that would mean, you know, it's the, the idea though of um of then you know pushing that onto onto other people i think uh is something that we that we shouldn't do and we can't do um, i would agree yeah yeah i think the path the path forward for me is to obey the law and be so obedient whereas people see the fruit of that obedience as so good and so right that they would actually want to come and obey the law alongside me. That's my goal. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as long as we're understanding that, that, that can only happen through, you know, God's grace and, um, that anything that, that is, um, even remotely us, you know, doing, doing good and, and righteous work that it's only because of, you know, God. And it's only because of, uh, Christ's death on the cross. Absolutely. It's, uh, it was his death on the cross that inscribed the law onto my heart, which now makes me desire to want to keep it. And it also through the Holy spirit enables me to do so. Whereas before in the old covenant, there, there was very much a limited sense where that they did not have the Holy spirit. I can't remember exactly where it is, but we're told that, um, the lowest believer in the new covenant would be greater than John the Baptist. And he was the greatest in the old covenant. Yeah, it's a big, it was a big upgrade. There was a lot of stuff that they weren't to, totally sure about, you know, like Peter's n- not associating with, associating with the Gentiles and like, is that okay? Because that's how it used to be. And yeah, it was a big shift. And he gave, what was it? He gave the, the people like 40 years after Christ's death to sort of like figure stuff out before he finally destroyed the shadow of the temple saying, Hey, you don't need this anymore. Animal sacrifices are done. You have something better. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Thanks, Stephen. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it.